Hey, it's Sam. And today I have something a little different for you. Um, I'm, I have a class that I want to show you, um, a video that I did several years ago where I talk about principles, methods, and outcomes. Principles, method, and methods, and outcomes are the three important ways to really understand the astrology that we're doing. Um, principles are the overarching principles, obviously. The methods are how you apply those principles. And then the outcomes are the outcomes that you want. Most people focus on the outcome. They say, when will I get married? How much money will I make? When will I do this? When should I do that? Make a prediction. Predictions are outcomes. They, But you can't make a good prediction and get a good outcome if you don't have good methods. The methods are what we use to get the outcome. But the methods don't work very well if you don't, if they're not based on sound principles. So principles are the most important, the highest leverage. For example, you need to understand what the planets are, what the elements are, what the what karma is, what evolution is. By the way, this is the stuff that most people don't have very clear. So if you don't have those things very clear, then the then you can jump to all of that because you think that's the easy stuff. Oh, planets, signs, karma, I know all that stuff. But give me some methods, right? Many times methods aren't that sound either with many astrologers. Oh, this is here, that's there. Let me gather a lot of methods. This is where a lot of students hang out. They hang out in this methods. Oh, it, what this harmonic chart is that? And I learned this yoga. I have all these details, all these things I've memorized. I don't know how to really use them all very well. I don't have anything prioritized or in the right order, but I have a bunch of methods that I know. I know this. I know Sati Sati is blah, blah. Sati Sati would be something like a method. This aspect. I know I have this aspect. That would be like a method. I have this yoga. I have this thing. So what does it mean? What is the outcome? The reason you don't know what any of it means and you can't predict an outcome is because you maybe have identified something as a method, like an aspect or yoga, but because that method isn't anchored in any real principles, you don't really understand the methods you're trying to use, so you don't get any outcome. You don't understand the outcome. That's why you need to start with principles and really understanding the principles first. And what I'm going to talk about today, as you can see, there's this thing that says compounding and it says business modeling, 10% increases at every step, blah, blah. What is this? I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but I'm going to show you why it's so important to leverage the principles first. You might hear me say this all the time and you're like, okay, Sam's going on again about how you can never go too deep into those principles. Well, what does it mean in real time? In fact, you can even see the math behind it. You can even see the mathematics behind it. Um, and that, and the mathematics behind it would even indicate um, something like, uh, like, like we're going to do here. And we're going to show you how increasing 10%, like if you, if you increase your knowledge of all of these different things by like 10%. Now I'm talking about the principles. You're going to see how 10% increases incrementally, especially when they're, when they're worked together and when they're leveraged shows an exponential increase in capacity and power. And we'll use business modeling as an example. When I started studying some business um, principles by some business leaders, they talk about making little improvements um, in their systems. If you just improve every part of your, let's say, sales process, which is what this will be about, by like 10%, let's say you get 10% more customers from 10% uh, more leads, customers, but leads from this source, 10% more from here, 10% more from here, and you increase little things 10%. Then on your, let's say your sales page, we'll be talking about like an online business. But if it's a store, it's like your sales, you know, process, whatever it might be like in a store, it's a salesperson or the way something is in a store. But there are, there are friction points. Let's say on a sales page, if you're talking about it on the internet, there are aspects of 
the sales page, there's a headline, there's a big theme, there's an offer, there are bonuses, there are guarantees. These are all part of a sales page. You increase each one of them by like, let's say 10%. Then you, after they watch the sales or they're on the sales page, let's say then they click the, okay, I'm, I wanna buy this thing. Doesn't mean they're gonna buy it, it means now they're gonna go to the checkout page. So then let's say you increase your checkout page percentage by 10%, each of the little sections of the checkout page where you restate the offer, where you have testimonials, where you have a guarantee, other things. These are all components. This stuff, the reason you see these same things on sales pages on the internet is because it's been tested, right? And optimized, it's called optimization. Then let's say that's the front end sale. The reason you have a back end sale like an upsell and a sales funnel is because now you increase that initial sale you, you now add something on the back and you say, well, if you like this, maybe you'll like this. And you optimize those things. So if we just look to just improve these things by 10%, it's not a lot, 10% at each one of these little friction points, you'll see what happens. So I'll, I'll just go through this real quick and you'll see how something that the same, exact same processes just optimized a little bit, 10% more increase winds up being more than almost 3x the return on investment as it's called a business ROI now in an astrological sense this is the same kind of thing because the, these are all principles this would be in the principles not the methods or the outcomes. some of it is in the methods as well you also increase your understanding of the methods then the outcomes are going to be um, exponentially better like more than three times better if you just increase and optimize, let's say your understanding of like what the planets are. Let's say you just increase your understanding of each planet by 10%. Let's say you increase your understanding of what karma is by 10% of what, you know, of what um, dharma is, the truth and the wisdom, ah, and what it really means and what the person is really looking for and all those things. Let's say you just increase each one of those little things by 10%. Then by the time you get to certain methods, like, okay, now each yoga, is going to be increased by 10%. Each, the concept of rulerships, oh, the planets are rulers. Okay, you increase that by 10%. The starting to chart from the ascendant and then moving here, ah, increase that by 10%. The moon by 10%. All of that together, little increments. You don't have to, it's not gigantic stuff, but even just a little bit of increase all the way down the line is going to be a gigantic improvement. So I'll show you the math here. It's pretty powerful. So again, there are many steps to an online business. First, you have leads to your website. So let's say you have current lead sources. Um, there are, um, let's say that that you, you have four these four lead sources. Okay, one and you, you generally get a hundred leads from each one. So that would mean that you normally draw like four hundred people to your sales page. Four hundred. If you increase each one of these lead sources by 10% separately, all, automatically it's 440. So you automatically have 10% more people, let's say, hitting the sales page. But this is where it starts to get interesting. So again, if overall the page was converting at 10%, but you optimize and improve each section by 10%, then you'll see what happens. So again, we're starting with, if 400 people hit the page, and they usually convert at 10%, and you usually get 40 sales, let's say, at the beginning of that whole process of, of, of bringing these leads, you're gonna see how 40 turns into 112 by just tweaking 10%, because you have to remember these things are leveraged, and you'll see what I mean. So based on the optimization, we already have four more sales because you already have 440 people coming at 10%, not 400, so there's already four there's already four more sales just based on optimizing the lead source, right? So before any of the other 10% of optimization occurs, you just get 40 more people at the page itself, even if nothing else changes. But let's go all the way through it, adding 10% of assumed efficiency at every step, every step. But let's realize that at every step of the um, funnel sales page, the results are compounded. They're additive. 440 people hit the sales page first, then each 10% gets added to the previous 10%. So the headline, 44%, I'm sorry, let's say um, this is in um, aggregate sales. 
if we take the 44 that we would have gotten at the end, we would just say 44 people will stick with it and go all the way through. If you optimize the headline, it now becomes actually 48. Then the 48 go to the big theme, and then you add 4.8 to 48, and you get about 53. Then 53 go to the offer, and you add 5 to that, and it's 58. Then 58 go to see the bonuses, you add about 6 to that, and you get 64. Then 64 go to the guarantee, and you add about 6 to that, and you get 70. Just compounding and getting and optimizing headlines, the big theme, the offer, the bonuses, the guarantee, just optimizing each one of them 10% more, you're going to suck the person in, and the 10% compounds. So, by the way, this, this is very conservative because we don't know where the snags are. You, people wind up, for example, you might wind up getting 400 hitting this page, and maybe, maybe you have a great headline, about 80 people like it, but then your big theme doesn't make a lot of sense, and this is where you start to lose them, and somewhere down the line it starts to snag. So this is even very conservative. I'm using just kind of conservative numbers, but the headline would say something like, you know, learn to be an astrologer and, you know, easy and affordable. Okay, that's a good headline. But then the big thing might be so that you can make a lot of money and impress your friends. Well, that might not be the right theme. That might not be the motivation. So maybe people would lose themselves there. Maybe the big theme would be something that you optimize, that you improve. So then those people that already liked it, that were optimized by the headline, get expanded. Then the offer. Oh, the offer is great. Maybe the offer wasn't so great before. Offer means you get this for this much money. Maybe it was too much money. Maybe it was not enough money. By the way, there's all kinds of ways to optimize. This is just conservative. And again, I don't want to spend forever on it, but this is the principle. But then, again, so this is the sales page. You start to see how 10% starts to get optimized. So what started as 40, it started as 40. By the end of an optimized sales page, winds up being about 70. By the way, I haven't even talked about the price. But winds up being 70, almost twice as many, just because you've optimized 10% at each friction point. Then they go to a checkout page. Again, they click buy. Now they're at a checkout page. Many people, most people, open a checkout page and they close it. They don't do it. So what if you optimize that? What if you got 10% more at each stage? You restate the offer in a 10% more efficient way. Well, then they're less likely to leave. But that 10% then keeps reading. Oh, they read these testimonials. Now they're optimized 10% more. By the way, I'm not making this stuff up. This stuff is tested. People that make a lot of money online on the internet, for example, this is the stuff they do, and it's totally testable. This is why you'll see people that'll, that'll spend $5 a click on Google, <laughs> because they've optimized this stuff. You think you'd pay $5 for somebody to click on your ad on Google? Are you crazy? $5 an ad? Well, if you optimize this stuff, they know how to turn that $5 into $200 <laughs> because they've optimized. So, you know, but anyway, you optimize that sales page. Again, the same sales page that at the end, you know, remember this whole process before only would get 40 sales. Now with just 10% optimization, by the end of it, again, restating the offer, this 70 becomes 77. And then you improve the testimonial. 77 becomes 84. Then 84 becomes 92. Just optimizing 10% because remember it keeps compounding. It's compounding. Then they go into an upsell funnel. All right. Again, these 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 things have many different friction points. I just added a few, but you know, make you know making sure that the funnel offer matches the original offer. Let's say you optimize that 10%. Then this 92 who bought. Remember, it started here. At four, it was originally 40, uh, 400. Now it winds up being taking 440 people, and you wind up getting ultimately 112 sales instead of 40. But the upsell funnel matches the original offer. Then this 92 becomes 101. Then the ease of acceptance. So it's a very frictionless. Just just click here, and you'll get this, and bubble, and you optimize that 10% better instead of like, oh, what do I do? Becomes 112. So this is how much a 10% optimization is a massive improvement, almost three times. I'm telling you this, of course, because you're about to watch a video that has to do with principles, methods, and outcomes. And all of these are friction points. Just like in a business, the, the more you understand those principles, 
the more you understand the elements and what they really are. Oh, I know the elements. Do you? Do you understand the connection between breath and thoughts and being scattered and marshalling all of that power into discrimination? Do you, do you really understand that? Do you think you could get a 10% improvement on that? 10% improvement on the element of of water and how it's flowing and yet it's oversensitive, yet it's devotional, yet it's smothering. I mean, 10%? Each one of the planets, Mars, do you really understand how anger and frustration becomes discipline and how people are trying to defend themselves in this black and white way? This is why they argue, but really it's just like a child who is trying to know the answer and ex I mean, excited for life. Do you really think 10%? increase would help you to really understand what that thing is you're really trying to analyze those principles they're the highest leverage because they're the furthest down by the way just like up here these lead sources this lead source again if you optimize this even more then you're going to get more people hitting this page that's where the whole thing starts this is why you see people this is like paying for those ads that i'm talking about optimizing that ad first if it's an ad that's where the big leverage comes first then of course once you get them there other ways to you know get it but these parts like the headline you know like the sales page and the and the rest of it is more like the methods so again all these principles to really understand the concepts then come into methods like harmonic charts ascendant the moon i know the transits my my you know you know padas and all the stuff that you're thinking that you know how to use to give you the outcome you want. Again, optimizing 10% of all of these things you think you know. This is why people study that are smart and that really want to know and really get good outcomes in their life. You don't need to, you know, master every single thing, even to the point like someone like me who has been doing this for 25 years. Um, you don't need to get that much. Just optimizing, optimizing everything that you already think you know a little bit. It's like doing this. By the way, these are the kinds of things I've used in my business. I've studied this stuff. I actually find it really fascinating. Um, again, even just understanding the psychology behind, like, I mean, you know, this is the business stuff, but behind why things are working the way they're working, your awareness and optimization pays gigantic dividends further down, especially when it comes to the outcomes, which is, again, people focus so much on the outcomes they forget the principles, they forget the methods, and everybody needs to optimize these things more. So without further ado, with that in mind, I want to present that video of principles, methods, and outcomes. Hey, it's Sam, and I'm back with another video in this Axis series, the Axis of Astrology. And as you see on the board behind me, I have principles, methods, and outcomes that I'm going to talk about in great depth in this video. I'm also going to go over the section of the mind map where I talk about methods and calculations and more important um, details to help organize the uh, principles that we've already studied. So before I get to that, I want to address one of the biggest concerns that people have once they start looking at these videos and think about maybe studying astrology. The biggest concern actually that people have is they wonder if they can actually learn it and they wonder if it's too hard for them and in fact maybe you think this maybe you're not even considering the fa the the option of really studying astrology deeply maybe you've given up on the idea that you could ever actually really do it well or do it professionally because you're just so used to being confused by all the other stuff and Again, the whole, this one says that, this one says that. Why are, why are what, you're, what you're saying any different? And I understand that part of it. So in these videos that I'm making, I'm trying to show you how systematic it is and how you can learn it. My work since I've been doing astrology is to learn how to teach it better in a more systematic way. And the success of my programs have shown the, you know, have shown the truth in that more than four or close to 400 registrants and close to 200 graduates over the last several years. 
but I, so I want you to understand that astrology is something that you can learn if it's taught correctly systematically you can learn it but what I can't change is your lack of confidence which is your lack of belief in yourself lack of belief in the future the fact that maybe you've completely given up hope that you can do something like that thinking that well Sam you can do it because you're some you know sort of gifted you know person and I know you're used to thinking that way about astrologers oh well they must know you know they're just sort of gifted somehow I could never do it well again one of the reasons why that happens is because you're not used to it being taught systematically correctly where one th where you start here and then you go here and it's unfolded sensibly what I would encourage you to do is really pay attention and certainly look at the comments on that my students who have gone through the course and graduated look at what they say about the program I've had people from extremely well studied students to people who've never studied at all and all of them get in the program and they find their understanding of astrology and life gets deepened and focused and the information that they've already gathered if they've been gathering a lot of information becomes much clearer and much more um, embodied and so what I said in one of the earliest videos and I'll say again you probably don't need to be gathering more information you need to actually comprehend and understand what you've already quote learned because again stated simply if you can't explain it then you don't understand it and don't worry most people don't so this is why in the course I have templates and and all kinds of you know worksheets and templates to help you say the words the, the exact words that you should say when you see a specific thing and again I spend a lot of time making sure these tools work and that's why we have such a success rate at the school and not just a success rate of level one but then most of them 75 percent or more go on to level two after that so the retention rate is very high and so again I'm just telling you this because I want you to challenge your own kind of bias challenge your own preconceived ideas about what's possible for you I mean imagine this time next year you could have gone through a whole course where you have absolute confidence reading astrology charts where you can engineer your success systematically where you know where to look exactly what to do what to say and not be confused it's probably hard for you to imagine if you're used to just kind of you know gathering little bits of stuff here snacking here and there but that's what the students that have studied with me have gone through but again I can't reach into your head and give you the confidence and also give you the hope because one of the biggest things that happen is we give up on our dreams we give up on them we don't even consider it anymore so crazy I have this happen in readings all the time where I will ask the person where the person will say you know I'm looking for my life purpose you know what should I be doing it's like you know what you should be doing you just don't even think it's possible so you're not even focused on what you want to do or what you hope to do you're focused on all of these things that don't even inspire you then you wonder why you're uninspired you have to fill your heart with the thing you love and the thing that interests you if you're watching this video I already know you're very interested in astrology if you're still watching this video now after I've said all of this and I haven't even talked about astrology yet then I know you're interested but you have to fill your heart with the thing that you love the most because the thing that you love and that interests you and that you enjoy is actually the fast track to your greatness it's not in some practical thing well but you can't make money at that so you gotta do some practical thing yeah some practical thing that you hate that you that you're ready to give up on immediately because you don't like it imagine doing something that you love doing it for a living helping others with it well that's what it that's what it can be again the thing that you love and the thing that you're curious about it's just like a mother and her child a mother can tell you everything about her child because she's so interested in it she's fascinated with it so fun, you, whether it's astrology or studying with me or anything I want you to understand this principle of life is that your greatness and the fast track to your genius is the thing you love the most the thing that you can't stop thinking about that you're so curious about that makes you feel so inspired that's where your greatness lies and you shouldn't give up on your greatness whether it's studying astrology whether it's studying with me or whatever it is 
you need to follow that. And I will just say this, that the study of astrology enhances everything else that you study. Just like it says in Brat Parashrahur Sastra, like I said in the first video, especially for the Brahmin, they should study Jyotish because it connects your limited mind with the cosmic mind. So with that in mind, let's get to this. And what I have behind me here, you see principles, methods, and outcomes. I talked about this in the first video. And this is the way we engineer our success. And you see there's a line from one to the next, an arrow, and then it hits the bullseye down here. So I spoke in general about principles, methods, and outcomes in the first video and use the idea of the outcome to satisfy your hunger. There's principles that you need to deal with, like distance, gravity, speed, right? Because you don't want to be too far away from a food source or else you can't get to it in time. And then there are methods that you would deploy, strategies, like go to the market, buy the food, do this. But again, look at the strategies. The strategies include the principles. You can't have a strategy that violates the principles. You can't say, okay, I'm just going to fly to the store. No, you can't fly. You need to honor the principles of gravity, distance, speed, for example. So methods must follow principles. This is why I started teaching principles first. first the first principles were like this whole thing about four and a half billion years. This is a principle that once you, that snaps into place, it expands everything right away. You understand what astrology really is and why the great rishis talked about the planets as Lord Vishnu. The planets are God themselves. This whole matrix that we're in is Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu, and you know, that's represented as him laying on the couch with the serpent behind him and all that, but it's actually a way to try to show the magical power of the universe, four and a half billion years. And then those principles that we understand um, that way filter down into those texts and Sanatana Dharma and all of those things that filter down immediately into gunas and elements. These, these are then the building blocks of form and how truth and Lord Vishnu creates beings and experiences here on this earth. He does it through gunas, elements, then the principles of the four poor shartas, dharma, arta, kama, moksha, planet signs, houses. These are all actually principles because they haven't done anything yet. They're all there. This is all the principles that are there making everything happen. That's how you can understand principles. They're the they're the laws of, of nature and life that we can't violate. We can't violate karma. Karma is never wrong. Dharma or truth is never wrong. The truth is always there. It's always shown in our actions. And karma is never wrong. There's nothing unfair. Your actions show the exact result. It might seem unfair, but you're looking at it from a point in the process that you might not, you know, you might not remember when this action created this result. It doesn't mean it isn't wrong. This genius universe that created things four and a half billion years with this amazing symmetry and this this beautiful structure is wise enough to not make mistakes, okay, and to pull you and create you at the right time. Those principles cannot be violated. They are the structures that everything else must operate in. Now, when you understand something, these are all the realm of, quote, principles, but if you expand your knowledge of each of these things, let's say by 5 to 10%, and then you compound that, like if your knowledge of astrology and your understanding of why the planets are Lord Vishnu, who Lord Vishnu is, this sacred age, each one of those things, if gunas, elements, planets, signs, each one of those things get expanded by like 5 to 10%, like each one. Let's say each planet, like your knowledge of the sun, grows and expands by 5 to 10% of the moon, of the signs, houses. Think of how much expansion that is just on, the con just on the idea of principles. Now see, these things are not separate. If you expand principles, then it's automatically going to expand your methods, especially the higher upstream we go. The higher upstream we go, the more impact it has on everything else downstream. Like for instance, your health. Let's say you're trying to do yoga, which is like a method. Let's say that your outcome is I want to be healthier, a method is yoga, and you have to honor principles like, you know, time and breath and, you know, temperature, you know, fatigue, all of those things. If your physical body gets stronger 
How much better will that make your yoga practice? And then how much better will that make your health? This is the most important thing, your understanding of the principles. That's why I stress this. And as I said in the first video, most people focus on this stuff. They start trying to get an outcome using dashes and transits, harmonic charts, research, you know, complicated things that are completely disconnected from the principles that rule everything and also the correct methods and the correct methods in the right order. So that's what I'm going to show you here, but I want you to understand this power of compounding. Compounding. In the last video I talked about principle stacking and you saw me do a little bit of it, but think of the method of compounding not just the category of principles, but each principle. This is what we learn in the course. In fact, the first module of the course, the first couple modules, is nothing but principles. For like three or four modules, it's just expanding everyone's awareness of all of these principles. And again, as each one expands, as your knowledge of each planet expands, then your knowledge of what an aspect is expands exponential. You have yogas. Now, you know, then we start getting into methods, which are ways to ways that the principles work together. Like when we use the when we use the principle of eating, we had those principles, but then a method like to, you know, to go to the store, you know, to get in the car, go to the store, bring it back. That would be like a method, right? That's a strategy. Aspects, using aspects is a strategy. Yogas, that's a strategy. You know, the dignities of the planets. Combustion, retrograde, rulerships, avashtas. There's a lot of methods. These are some of the main methods that you use. And, you know, methods are where we start getting into calculating things. That doesn't mean we're doing anything to get an outcome yet. For example, you can know that you've got to get in the car and drive to the store, okay? But you've but you got to do things in the right order. Here it is. Priority and sequence is just as important as method. If you, like, for instance, let's say that your outcome is I want to eat scrambled eggs, okay? you got to deal with the principles of heat and, you know, um, you know, again, the universal principles. You've got to crack the egg, all kinds of stuff. Then there are methods which have to do with, like, you know, cracking an egg, turning on the stove, right, putting butter in the pan. That's to get the outcome. But if you do the methods in the wrong sequence... What if the first thing you do is you, is you crack an egg and then you put it on the stove and there's no pan there? You crack an egg, you, 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 you go to put it on the stove, there's no pan there, then you turn the heat on, then you take the pan out, then you put butter, right? This is what people do. <laughs> I'm telling you, when I read your comments and people ask me questions, it's basically, that's basically what it looks like to me all the time, most of the time. People are saying, okay, how come I crack the egg and put it on the stove with no pan and it doesn't make sense? Or, like, well, because you're doing it in the wrong order, you don't understand the principles, you don't understand the methods, you don't understand what method, or you grab a little piece of this and then try to do a little bit of that. Usually what people will do is they'll say, okay, I have this aspect and I'm in this dasha, what's that mean? It's like, well, what that means is you're basically you know, cracking the egg and, and trying to put it on the stove before there's a pan there, or butter in the pan, and wondering why you're not getting a scrambled egg. You're just getting a mess that you have to clean up, or you ask me to clean it up. It's why I don't even bother. It's too much. I don't have time. <laughs> I, I, only, you know, I have time to teach my students that have actually made a commitment to this, and then I'll help them unravel all of it. But then they're not asking those kind of questions because they're starting at the right place and then by the time they get to asking these questions they're actually asking an appropriate question at the right time you see so right now where we're at in the sequence of videos is we're right here I'm gonna start talking about these methods aspects yogas dignities again these things are incredibly important these are the things that determine the outcome outcomes are determined by understanding these things and the outcomes the things that we use to get the outcome is the dasha, the transit, harmonic charts, priority and sequence means everything's not as important as everything else and you don't do everything in the same order, right? Like for instance, putting salt and pepper on the eggs is less important than making sure that there's a pan on the stove and that, it's, that the egg is cooked. You know, and again, you do it in the wrong order and this is actually what people do when they start trying to reach for this very complicated 
technique. Very complicated technique. Oh, well, you know, actually it's that I have this, you know, Shiva Yoga in the Navamsha chart in the 8th house, and it's Nietzsche Bongo with, uh, you know, with the Dasha ruler, so what is that? So that means that it's, bleh. it's like I'm putting salt, I'm sprinkling some salt on this omelet that is, that is a mess all over the stove, and I'm c convinced that that's the right thing to do, and I'm asking you if that's right. Is that right? Right? So it's just, it's just a mess. Priority and sequence, you need to know that everything's not as important as everything else and the right order to do things in. And then research, again, it, you know, in order to get consistent outcomes, after you understand all of these things, then you need to research, which is very much implicit that you need to stop looking at your chart. Again, students focusing on their chart all the time. It's not scientific. You're, you're not going to be able to engineer success. Consistent results reading astrology charts by looking at your chart. It's like someone trying to be a doctor by just looking at their own body. It doesn't work. Okay, so research, case studies, and then reading, actually reading, reading charts. When in my course, I'm always there encouraging and pushing my students to read charts. Have conversations. People are already having conversations. Enter those conversations and, and start seeing what happens. Start, you know, you know, taking it out of your head and into your mouth and saying the words. So I give them the templates for the things to say and all that. I really help them do it. So this is how you can engineer that outcome of getting consistent results reading astrology charts. But again, I want you to understand this whole concept of principles, methods, and outcomes. If you start seeing, let's say you even see like a 10 percent, like the aggregate of principles is a 15 to 20 percent increase, which it's actually much more. Once you start gaining, once you start really learning each guna and element and purusharta, you start applying your expanded wisdom of the gunas and how they impact the planets and how they impact the signs and the houses and the elements, what the element really is and what part of the sign it is. All of these things start to expand immensely, but let's just say you just get like a 20% growth in the principles, then you're already going to go into the methods with an expanded 20%. So what would have been like, let's say 10% here is already going to be 30%. Then you get a 20% increase in that 30%. What I'm saying is that these are compounded. They compound each other. So you might be looking at aspects now. Like I say, this is why I try to let people understand that if you don't know this stuff, then your, your entry point into all of this, all of this, is so shallow. When this expands, then how much more expansive are aspects, are yogas, are the dignities, are the rulerships? They're already so much more you know, you know, so much more abundant. And then how does that translate once you start looking at a dasha? I'm in this dasha, what does that mean? Again, you don't even know what the planet means, really. I mean, maybe you do, but, you know, but what I'm saying is relative. You're only going to understand the dasha relative to how much all of this goes, and then, you know, based on what that planet rules. And then, so, just to understand that once you unfold everything in the proper order, there's this compounded effect of what you're learning, expanding everything underneath of it. And then by the time you're ready to make an outcome, you are hitting a bullseye. Okay, so now I'm going to go over the mind map here and be talking about the calculations. Um, and that falls in this... Um, rough category of methods. This is where we start getting into methods. Um, you know, calculations include things like aspects, house rulerships, retrograde and combustion, dignities, yogas, and important placements. So we see all of those things wind up being the methods that we deploy in order to get an outcome. Then those methods interact with timing and other kinds of structures like harmonic charts, priority and sequence that I already mentioned. But so a lot of people focus again on these methods. They're like, oh, I have this aspect. What does that mean? This yoga, what does that mean? My plan is combust. What does that mean? Especially when then they talk about a dasha too. So as I already explained. 
So in many ways, though, I also want to say that these things are also principles. Like when we get into the course, first you need to explain the principle of an aspect. Like what is an aspect? It's a drishti. It's when one planet looks at another. And as, it's, as you see in the, in the mind map, it says planets communicating. And it shows our inner strengths and conflicts. Some are one-way aspects. There are also mutual aspects. And it can show where one planet can dominate another. So again, the whole principle of an aspect is also important. And then how to interpret the aspect has to do with other principles like the dignities of the planets and what the planets rule and all that stuff. So as you see, the next thing is house rulerships. Very important calculation and also principle. Um, but the house rulerships shows the unique nature of each planet. For instance, this is why you can't just say, well, Jupiter's good, Saturn's bad, because for Taurus, Jupiter is the most disruptive planet. For and, and for Taurus, Saturn is the most auspicious planet, actually. So this is based on house rulership. And as you see, auspicious or not, often... And it does have to do with the functional status of the planet, which is its nature as a house ruler. And it shows whether it's obstructing something or edifying it. So house rulership's incredibly important calculation and, you know, generally falling in that rubric of methods that we deploy. And again, Raj Yogas are totally based on these rulerships. And so we also have another calculation, retrograde and combustion. They're sort of in the same category because they have to do with the proximity of the planet to the Earth. Again, that's a principle. The principle of retrograde and combustion is its relationship to the Earth. When a planet is on the other side of the Sun from the Earth, it is combust. When a planet is really close to the Earth, it is retrograde. So again, that in itself, that principle, tells us the nature of retrograde and combust. So when a planet is purified, you know, a planet is getting purified when it's c combust. We can see that because it's on the other side of the sun. Its rays are coming through the sun, pure, you know, getting purified. And it's somewhat confusing when it's retrograde. It appears to move backward. And then it can be also somewhat frustrated when it's, when we experience the combustion. There can be some frustration, but that is again purifying it. And we can feel kind of lost when it's retrograde, but retrograde and combustion, very important calculations. Then the dignities, very important calculation that we deploy to be able to see whether or not there's a lot of intelligence unfolding with that planet or at that time. You know, the level of intelligence, you know, when a planet is in high dignity or low dignity, of course, people tend to focus on the extremes, which the main one is exalted, debilitated, good, bad, because we want to polarize things and not understand them with the right amount of discrimination, things like dignities especially get very polarized. So for instance, great enemy dignity is almost just as bad as debilitated. Great friend dignity is almost just as good as exalted, for example. It can be better. It can, it can give better results. So there's a lot of things when you understand what the dignities actually are. And it affirms certain principles, especially the principles of Dharma and the unfolding of consciousness. Dignity is a level of intelligence which in many ways has to do with that sattvic guna, that wisdom that the planet has in its highest um, uh, dignity. And again, as it says here, more than just exalted and debilitated, and it shows important character traits. So planets at high dignity show those, those energies that we have a lot of confidence in. And again, it sounds like, oh, that's good. Not necessarily. It's only one thing. So, for example, you can get a planet that's, let's say that it's exalted, just to make it easy, but it's an, it's an exalted functional malefic. Let's even say something like, um, you know, like Jupiter, exalted for, or no, let's say Venus, exalted for Leo. Okay? That's an exalted functional malefic, and it's a natural benefic. But... It's a functional malefic because it rules two difficult houses, and it's exalted, which means the person will have a lot of confidence and pursue those things. So this will show a Leo person that pursues a lot of Venus stuff, but 
the Venus stuff is very incongruent with the Leo person, so it can be very disruptive. So again, you have to understand that it's not that simple. Exalted and debilitated are not just good and bad. You have to bring in the other qualities of the house rulerships, what the planets rule. Again, like I said at the beginning, all of these principles, if you just get, even what I'm discussing now, if you were to just get a, like a 10% improvement in your understanding of each one of these things, let's say that your understanding of aspects improved 10%. And then your understanding of house rulerships improved 10%. And your understanding of retrograding combustion expanded 10%. And of dignities, 10%. And of yogas and important placements, 10%. Okay, that's 50% in aggregate. But then once you start putting those things together, like you, every, every yoga includes the planets as house rulers. So again, they're not even separate from each other. A 10% improvement in each category is fine, but then you start putting them together because yogas and dignities are, un, are inseparable from each other and inseparable from the rulerships because rulerships are based on yogas and they're based on, or I'm sorry, yogas are based on rulerships. So this compounding effect of learning principles, getting this just subtle improvement in your knowledge of everything that you think you already know, shows remarkable depth and brings remarkable confidence. This is why I say you can engineer your outcomes and engineer success once you start learning these things correctly, starting with the principles and then moving down into each of these methods. It's why I say so often, if people, you probably already have gathered enough. You, if you know what these things are that I'm describing, you just need to actually know how to use them. It's probably plenty, especially when you start plugging them into harmonic charts with dashes and doing it in the right order and all of that. It's so much. So again, the last thing here is yogas and important placements. Yogas are the connections of power or the connections of weakness and also nuanced mixing of both. They're complex and subtle. And there's a nuanced mixing of both because the planets rule different houses. Like for instance, that Let's say a planet that's a, that's a benefic, okay, that's a naturally good planet. Let's say, for instance, Venus for Gemini, okay, it's one of the best planets for Gemini. It rules the fifth house, but it also rules the twelfth house. So what does that mean? Well, it means a sense of loss, twelfth house, through creative pursuits, fifth house. So this is why Gemini will tend to lose money. They'll spend their money, which is money leaving his 12th house on Venus things that they enjoy that are creative. Enjoy Venus creative fifth house. So you see the mixture of both things and it's a nuance and it's a subtlety. It's a subtle dance, for example. So you start to see this mixture when you, and again, this is a compounded principle, right? You're not going to see that Venus active until Adasha runs, until it's in, involved in a yoga, it's involved in, in a rulership, it's ruling something, it's getting ruled. That's when the nuance comes out. But again, look at how many things, if you improve your understanding of what an aspect is, let's say a one-way aspect or a mutual aspect, mutual aspects are when planets are opposite each other, but for instance, Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter also cast one-way aspects. So let's say there's a one-way aspect onto Venus, who is the fifth and twelfth lord, and it's in a certain house and it's joined another planet forming a yoga, let's say a Raja Yoga. Okay, well we already know Venus rules the fifth and the twelfth house. Let's say that it's joined Jupiter which rules the seventh and the tenth house. Okay, so now we've improved, now we've taken another thing and now we've also improved our understanding of what the yoga is, what the two planets are as house rulers, what they are as natural rulers, what the one-way aspect is, and these are the things that you say to the person. The, the specifics of those things, back with the guna, the element, the motivation. Again, it might sound complicated, but it's actually very sensible when it's unfolded in the right way. And what I'm showing you is that if you just improve your understanding of each of these things a little bit, then by the time you get to evaluate something that's not really that hard to see at all, your understanding of it grows exponentially, and you don't have to go reaching for some crazy nutty calculation to say, oh, that's where the real answer is. That's not where the real answer is. 
The real answer is all that stuff that maybe you already know. That's where the real answers are. Because you drill deeper down into all of those things as universal principles. First, you'll really understand what Venus is. You'll really understand what Jupiter is. You'll really understand why they have a conflict. And the big inner conflict between Venus and Jupiter. You see, that's one of the things I said here. In the, um, in the, in the aspects, you see at the top, inner strengths and conflicts. Planets communicating with each other. Inner strengths and conflicts. Mercury, Venus... Joining strengthens a lot of both of them because they share many things in common. Venus Jupiter shows an inner shows much more of an inner conflict. Certain things are strengthened, but then there's more in conflict than there is strength. So again, understanding this is how you read someone's mind. This is how you understand their inner conflict. It's not by reaching for some bewildering, crazy calculation. It's by reading this what you see in the chart correctly. That's how you do it. And again, you have to also do it at the right time and in the right order, which I'm going to get into in the future videos. You don't just say it indiscriminately because they might not be getting those karmas at that time. It might even be something that's not as prominent in their life because maybe something else is much more dominant, but it will be there. When, when you have to talk about Venus themes, it's going to be mixed with that, for example. So again, these calculations are actually just part it, they're actually part of the principles as well, principles and also methods, but we start having to calculate things. And again, each one of these calculations are also a principle in themselves, as a principle of an aspect, the principle of a yoga, when planets join. And when they join in certain ways, they form a lot of power or they take power away. And then, again, it also folds in everything you've already learned. It's not separate from this, meaning... After you've learned what Jupiter, Venus, Saturn really are, then you start looking at what their aspects are. And you bring all of that, again, all of that compounded power gets moved into a more subtle area. So right away, the thing that you already know, oh, I already know that. Do you really know it? Do you really understand it? And how, and how important is it to be able to memorize it or to really interpret it? So this is something, you know, again, very important that most students just are totally not, not on top of is this illusion that memorization is mastery. Understand this. Memorizing things is not mastery of them. It's easy. Any monkey can memorize this stuff. Anyone. Any, any five-year-old can learn how to actually look at the chart and go, Saturn is in the fifth house. It's not hard. It's just a matter of identifying something. It has nothing to do with mastering what that means and interpreting it and understanding it. And so again, as students keep going and just gathering more and more details, more and more details, they get further and further away from an actual good interpretation because they just keep piling details that are disconnected from the core one on top of another. It's, you know, piling complexity on top of confusion. And on top of illusion, because there's an illusion that they already understand. Oh, I already know what, I already know what uh, the sun is, but what about this? Do you really know what the sun is? Can you explain it really well? So again, piling complexity on confusion is what students do. So again, imagine if you just really got solid in all of that. Then when you start looking at an aspect... Boy, you come at it from a very deep point. Your entry point into everything that you already know is magnified, you know, you know, ten hundredfold. By the time you start leveraging the compounding effect of deepening things through principles and methods, then by the time you actually start to try to get an outcome, you can already see the impact. And this is the way all knowledge works. When you learn anything, you, you learn it this way. Anything that you've comprehended, this is how you've learned it. That's why I said in the first video, I'm going to show you how really you learn anything. And how, as you can see, I've broken down how, these, how to learn because I spend most of my time figuring out how to teach it better so that people like you can actually learn it. So this is a very important step here, all of these calculations. How the, you know, the aspects, how the planets work with each other, showing our inner strengths and conflicts, one way or mutual aspects. It shows where one planet you know, sort of dominates another one. 
like that Jupiter Venus, depending on the sign and the dignity, you'll see one is probably dominating the other one a little bit. If it's in a fire sign, Jupiter's kind of dominating Venus. In an earth sign, Venus is kind of dominating Jupiter. Again, so all of this kind of subtlety, house rulerships, is something that most students are incredibly weak on, incredibly weak. The functional status of the planet as a house ruler is really everything in determining the results. It's everything. It's even more important than the planet as a karika. It's more important that Venus rules the third and tenth house for Leo than the fact that it's the karika of relationships. When you're trying to determine the karmas that unfold, the house rulerships are much more important, frankly. The karika, it's important as well, but how they experience that thing is totally based on what the the houses that the planet rules. Retrograding combustion, again, very important to understand the astronomy, especially why the planets, when they're further away, act one way, when they're closer to the Earth, act another way. And of course, the dignities show everything to do with the intelligence behind what happens. For example, we sometimes we don't get something and we're just fine with it. And not getting that thing sets off a, a, a sort of cascading effect of enormous wisdom. That's often a planet in very good dignity, but set up to take something away. Or sometimes we get something and we hate it. We don't enjoy it at all. That might be a planet that is set up to give something, but in very low dignity. Many times the planets in low dignity give their results, but we don't enjoy it. And again, here's something you need to understand. I'll just tell you this. Exalted or debilitated has nothing to do with giving a result. Nothing. It has to do with how much wisdom we get from the thing. Getting it or not getting it doesn't have to do with the dignity. Nothing. They just forget they're, they're not even related. We get things based on yogas. Yogas produce results. What the planets rule and where they go and when the dashas run, that's what shows what happens. How much we enjoy it, how much we benefit from it, how much consciousness comes is shown by other things. Dignities, aspects, and other influences. So again, the reason all that's just a mess is, it's a, is because you haven't done enough research, you haven't looked at enough charts. Again, so in the course, this is what we do. We go through all of it at the right time. You learn all this stuff first, and then by the time you start getting into looking at charts and we're looking at case studies, you understand, oh, okay, just like you said back then, right. Now that makes sense why my sister's chart, she has that exalted Venus, and then, God, she when she ran her Venus Dasha, she got... You know, she got a divorce and, and had an affair and blew her whole life up. Well, that's why, for example. Not like, by the way, not like that's going to happen necessarily, but just in a general sense. So, anyway, going deeper into these things, um, I hope you enjoyed this video and look out for a few more in the future.